What's going on? Alex here, and I'd like to welcome you to a very special Efros Financial Power Hour. I promised you amazing guests, insightful guests, knowledgeable guests, and today I'm happy to deliver on that promise. On this channel, we discuss all sorts of personal finance matters, taxes, investments, business, but all roads lead to estate planning. Because as they say, you can't take it with you. Whether you have cash, real estate, retirement accounts, business interests, you need to figure out how that's going to be managed and who's going to manage it when you're no longer around. Our guest is a renowned estate planning attorney with over 35 years of experience. He's a certified specialist in estate planning and trust and probate law, handling high net worth planning, business succession, and trust and estate disputes. He's a partner with Fox Rothschild, which is a national firm composed of over 950 attorneys, so a little bigger than Efros Financial. And with that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Peter S. Myers. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Alex, and I hope I can match your enthusiasm with my presentation or the Q&A that we're about to uh, go through. So I'm, I'm doing well. As you can see, I'm in my office in San Francisco. I could probably pull up the curtain and you can see the beautiful lights in the background, which I may do uh, during a pause in our presentation. Well, we may have to take you up on that. Yeah, so I know I'm your excited. audience is going to want to see the view from my office. <laughs> yeah, that's how that's how you sell the clients, right? They come into the <laughs> office for the estate planning. They stay for the view, correct? Uh, yeah. All <laughs> right. So estate planning is a vast topic. There's a lot to know, a lot of ins and outs. So I wanted to jump right into it and start off at the 30,000 foot view and then get into the nitty gritty details. So to jump off, I thought a great way to start is to ask the big question, is estate planning only for the wealthy or is this something that everyone can and should take advantage of? Estate planning is about control. Um, so first of all, it's not about um, relinquishing control. You know, a lot of people go down the path of, I don't want to see an estate planner because I'm going to jinx it. You know, I'm going to die after I see them. You're going to die. I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm, I, eventually, I mean, maybe we'll all live to 150 years. That's tomorrow's presentation. Um, but we may become disabled before we die. We may become re-enabled before we die, after we become disabled. When you go in for heart surgery, you're down for seven days, you come back. Who's going to manage your affairs during those seven days? So um, people all over the economic spectrum uh, need estate planning. Our practice focuses on high net worth, but we do a lot of upper middle class planning, what I call mid tier planning. Um, so, you know, net worths in the seven figures, uh, even a low seven figure net worth can be an appropriate candidate uh, for our firm. But there are firms, um, typically sole practitioners, um, suburban type practices, although there are a number of uh, practitioners in the city who will do a very, very smallest, very modest, I should say, estates. Um, primarily, you know, you're thinking about the single mom who's concerned about, uh, oh my God, that my, his father, my child's father is going to be the guardian and is going to be controlling my child's money. That can frighten the bejesus out of a lot of people. And so they want to hire a lawyer to ensure that the money is separated from the guardian. Uh, that's one example of how even a very modest estate could use an independent third party trustee, for example, in that case, that would be independent. The, 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 the boy or girl's father is going to be the natural guardian unless they've committed a felony and they're in prison. The court, the juvenile dependency court, is likely to appoint the natural parent as the guardian. So, so that we, we, you know, we could nominate a successor if he or she happens to die in the same fiery crash. Uh, but. The reality is that the natural parent is going to be in control of the minor child. So even in that situation, um, very modest estate, you would have estate planning all the way up to, you know, we have billionaire clients. Um, I, I don't mean to say that cavalierly, but, you know, typically with a larger client like a billionaire, you, you're working on a team. You're working with a team of advisors there. There may be a family office involved. There's usually. Uh, closely held business with an in-house CFO. Um, you're often working through agents and other financial advisors and accountants. 
sometimes the lawyer becomes the trusted advisor. You know, I do have a few clients that are very wealthy where I'm the primary, I'm like the general counsel. Um, so that can happen to the lawyer is sometimes the quarterback in that circumstance. But oftentimes it's the CFO of the family office that's the quarterback in the larger estates. And then the mid-tier estates, it's often a combination of the financial advisor, somebody like you, Alex, and and I'm in the background. I get called in, you know, hey, what do you think about this? Um, for strategic and tactical judgment calls, not necessarily for day-to-day, -day, you know, should should you buy this car? <laughs> you know. I'm not going to get involved in that decision. Right, right. And is there a threshold in terms of income or assets or life events that when it happens, you know you need to call an estate attorney? Well, California has an interesting procedure. They have what's called a an affidavit, uh, a testamentary affidavit procedure under the, under the probate code. And if your estate's under $165,000 total, you can avoid a probate simply by uh, a will and the will will designate the and you could even do a testamentary trust that way so you could designate testamentary trust just means a, a trust that springs into existence when you die and so you could name um, trusted sibling as the trustee of a trust for minor child even at one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars so in a will. We, we, we threw out a lot of big terms there so i just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page who may not be all that familiar with estate planning. So if we could back up a bit and just define what estate planning really is, because I'm sure a lot of people out there have heard the term, but it's difficult for them to conceptualize exactly what it entails. Sure, it's controlling your affairs while you're alive and well. Um, and so you wanna structure the estate plan so that you're in control while you're alive and well, that your health is taken care of. And if you're not well, so if you're not alive, that's that's death. Obviously, you know that. Then you don't have to worry too much about it, right? <laughs> well, it, it, you know, we have a will and a trust, and we have we have structures uh, to deal with death. But incapacity is, you know, you want to define. You, you don't just want. A lot of times, you'll see, you know, probably ninety percent of the wills and trusts I see define don't even have a definition of incapacity. They'll say, if I become incapacitated, my trustee shall step in. What is that? You know, how do we persuade a bank that you become the successor trustees trying to get access to the money to pay the bills? How do they persuade the bank you're incapacitated? So one of the things we need to build into the will, trust, power of attorney, et cetera, is a de definition and ideally a determination of incapacity. So what does it take to become incapacitated? You want to give what you have when you want to give it to the people you want to give it in the manner in which you want to give it. So estate planning can be small estate, maybe outright, or trusted beneficiaries, all outright, you know, right. uh, a, a larger estate with trusted beneficiaries, you might use a beneficiary control trust. So it's, it's thinking about who, how, and when they're going to get it. And controlling are, it while you're alive, you're the who while you're alive. And then you, what we do for disability provisions, we bake in, you know, can, can gifts be made? Because if you don't include a provision in your trust or your power of attorney that allows gifting during your incapacity, it's fro your, your estate's basically frozen. So even the fruitcake that you give to Aunt Mabel at every Christmas, you know, technically that's a violation of the trust. You can't, you can't do holiday gifts. Um, so, you know, baking in provisions for what kinds of gifts are appropriate should you become incapacitated. You're in a nursing home. Maybe you want to enable your agent under the power of attorney to m deliberately make gifts to qualify you for Medi-Cal. So the Department of Healthcare Services covers the nursing home tab and you have cash outside of that to cover things like, you know, your haircuts and your grooming and your massages. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're able to, to be uh, taken to a movie theater. Um, that's not going to be covered by any Medicaid, Medi-Cal type insurance. So are there assets outside of your immediate estate that can take care of that? So you want to have a power of attorney that enables your agent to do those things, to have that flexibility to care for you should you need it. Okay. And we mentioned estates, a will, a trust. And what are, on a very basic level, the pillars of a solid 
estate plan? What are the bread and butter elements on which everything else is built? Well, is there a, a checklist, a bullet point? Yeah, there are, do there are documents that are, that are customary in every plan, but the elements really have to be goals. You know, because if we draft documents based on forms, you're going to have somebody else's estate. You go to Nolo Press or you go to, you know, some software company. You're going to have somebody else's plan, somebody else's form is in there. So it has to begin with the client's goals. And if your goal is, you know, keep money away from my ex spouse, um, or maybe your goal is make sure my children don't have unfettered access when they turn 18, because they're just going to go buy a Ferrari. Um, make sure that we stretch out my retirement accounts so that they defer recognition of income, meaning they defer the tax on your retirement account for as long as possible so that they can use it as their own retirement account. The, those are the goals. Those goals drive the documents, okay? And if the goal is to save estate taxes, which if you have a large estate, that's often one of the goals, we use a whole separate set of techniques to deal with that. Um, a blended family will have a set of goals. A blended family creates a whole different kind of, of estate plan than um, I love you, honey, you know, nuclear family, mom, pop, two kids all by the same marriage. Everybody is healthy and stable. Um, adult children are responsible. That's a relatively straightforward plan, except you still have issues in that plan because daughter gets married um, to husband. Uh, both parents die. Uh, if they leave assets outright to daughter and then she predeceases her husband, who's going to what happens to mom and dad's money then? And if daughter gets that disposition outright and she has POD or holds joint accounts with her husband, the son-in-law that they may or may not like is going to get that money and he may remarry and may have another family through the new marriage. And you've completely disinherited your grandchildren, maybe from the other child. So thinking through your goals is really essential, the essential first step, you know, before we talk about documents. Now, documents. Everybody wants to know, well, what's included as though like the documents are, are the hard part. The documents are the easy part. The counseling is the hard part. The, the stuff you and I are kicking around now is the hard part. The easy part are drafting documents. Usually there's in a middle class plan, there'll be a revocable living trust. In California, it'll be a joint revocable living trust. If the one of the spouses has a substantial amount of separate property, there might be two trusts. There might be a husband separate property trust, a wife separate property trust, and a joint revocable trust, or a one spouse, other spouse in a same sex marriage, separate property trust, and then a joint community property trust for the community. And they might have different provisions because one spouse is going to want to control their separate property without the permission of the other spouse. So the trust package is usually at the top and that's going to guide any trust assets. So, so and just to define of, separate property and community property for those who aren't familiar with it, what are the differences there? Yeah, there are nine community property states or 13 that allow community. It, it, it's a little tricky, but community property states are typically states that are in the southwest of the U.S. They were part of the Mexican session. They're based on civil law, Mexican civil law, and, and Louisiana, which is based on French civil law. Uh, and these states all adopted a, a community property regimen by which property is held by the marriage jointly, by the community. And... So you have a right to will at your death half of the community property. You have a right to will all of your separate property. Separate property is defined to be the property that you brought into the marriage that you had before you even got married. Um, I bought this house before we got married. Now, if you have a mortgage on it and you're contributing to the mortgage, you're commingling community property. If you're contributing community property to pay down the mortgage, now you're tainting that separate property house with community property. So we need to make a distinction between separate and community right away. In many cases, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the, the couple got married when they were right out of college and every, they had nothing but student loans. Um, and so everything is community. Maybe they didn't inherit. The other, the other aspect of separate property is inheritance. Property gifted or inherited by one spouse during the marriage. That's going to retain its character as its separate property unless there's what's called a transmutation where they convert it. To community property in California it requires a writing and some others or evidence of intent to transmute and other states there are different thresholds for that 
Now, common law states don't have community property. So you look at the other, you know, 35 to 40 states, depending on, but some states have hybrid, Tennessee, Alaska, South Dakota, et cetera. Florida now has a hybrid statute where you can opt into a community property regime. Um, so you need to know the, the state from which the client is, um, is working, is operating, um, before you can re even determine whether they have separate community or whether you need to make this distinction. And then in many instances, you get the, the, the person leaving the community property state and going to a common law state, going to a separate property state, then what? You know, how much of the community goes with them? That's a whole conversation. And it depends upon whether the state they go to has enacted the Uniform Disposition of Community Property on Death Act. Okay. <laughs> so just to make sure I understand, <laughs> separate so property was separate prior to the marriage. Yep. And if you're in a separate property state or non-community property state, it can very well stay that way throughout the marriage. And if the marriage were to end at some point, whereas if you're in a community property state and you earn assets after the date in which you get married, you acquire them through income or inheritance, they may be thrown into the same stew and then it's very difficult to separate it from, from there. It basically goes 50-50, right? No matter yeah, if one spouse contributed more marriage. or the other. Yeah, earnings from the skill, labor, and effort of either spouse during marriage are going to be community. So um, okay. wife becomes CFO of a publicly traded company. All of her stock options, all of her restricted stock units, all of that is going to be community property. So that if they get a divorce, and community property, some people think, oh, it's owned 50-50 by each spouse. And that's not how it works. You don't have a, a piece of tape down the middle of the house and say, oh, that half is your half and that half is my half. It's it's similar to holding property in a business. You you hold you both have the ability to transfer. You like when you go to the grocery store, the clerk doesn't ask you, do you have your spouse's permission to buy these groceries? Of course not. You know, I, they wouldn't ask that question because each spouse, either spouse, spouse, has complete control over the community subject to a fiduciary obligation to the other spouse. All right, so they can't just go to Vegas with a community property and gamble it away without the permission or consent of the other spouse. Um, although we've seen that and it often leads to our family law group down the hall, uh, which is the divorce group. The <laughs> it's nice to have all of them in the adjacent offices that helps oh, yeah. the efficiency. Um, so going back to the estate planning documents. So once someone has established their intent, their goals, and they understand how they want their assets to be distributed, how do then the documents play into that? So there's a trust, which we just talked about at the trust level. And I see there's a question about what, what advice would you give for picking an executor? Understand that the executor is a technical term of art that deals with the person who carries out the terms of a will. A will is a different document from a trust. Usually, if you have a trust-centered plan, which most you know, modern practitioners uh, uh, work with because it avoids probate. Sometimes you may want to probate for other reasons. Um, you're going to have a pour over will. So the will will take anything that is not put into the trust during life, not funded correctly to the trust, and pour it into the trust. So the trust is still the governing instrument with this fallback, this fail safe. Whoops, I left this asset out or the decedent left this asset out. We're going to dump it back into the trust. So, the so just to back up a bit on that point, the you mentioned a will and then you mentioned a pour over so if we could just focus on the will portion for one second uh what are the advantages and disadvantages to having the will in place itself well usually you pair a will with a trust um and and it's a poor it's a pour over will paired with a trust if it's a standalone will so you have no trust it would just be that your entire estate is going to govern by the will you're forcing it into probate. You're forcing your estate into probate if there's more than $165,000 governed by that will. Meaning that, you know, your estate's a million bucks. If you add your house, your death benefit of your life insurance and, you know, other things that you've, you've uh, driven by the will, you know, the will decides where they go. You've forced a court proceeding. So the idea of a trust is to avoid the court proceeding. People say a probate is a lawsuit against yourself for the benefit of your creditors. You know, it's a, you know, an inside joke for probate lawyers. Probate lawyers, 
you know, make a statutory commission off the probate. Uh, the executor is required to be bonded. The executor is required to do an inventory and appraisal. A probate examiner is looking over the shoulder of the executor the whole time. They have to do an accounting before they do a distribu uh, distribution. They have to notify creditors. They have to pay creditor claims. They have to litigate creditor claims if those happen. So in general, we don't like, you know, in, in, in a case where the client has their wits about them and they want to maintain as much control as possible, we use a trust to avoid, you know, a judge in robes having the control over the client's estate and potentially um, making a, a public, uh, uh, a, what would otherwise be a private document, a very public uh, exposition. So even if in your will, you specify that you want your assets to be distributed evenly to your five kids, you still need to go through the probate process in that case, correct? If, if you don't have a trust, uh, a living trust, and if it's not fully funded, then and you have more than one hundred sixty-five thousand dollars passing under that will, then yes, you're you're back in court. The judge is going to appoint the executor. Presumably, you've nominated them in a will. And one of the questions: Who should I choose for executor? It's the same role as successor death trustee. So understand the will goes with death. A power of attorney, which we haven't discussed yet, goes with incapacity. So you have so, trust for trust assets, right? Real estate, investment accounts, um, life insurance you can put in trust, um, business interests, um, depending upon the plan document, you can put restricted stock units, stock options, et cetera, into trust, into a revocable living trust. So whatever you can, you want to put into the trust. <clears throat> and that there has to do with the yeah. pour over provision on the will, correct? So if... There are assets that just happen to be titled in the individual's name. The pour over portion of the will should take care of that and transfer the ownership or provide instructions for the transfer of the ownership to the trust, correct? A dead person can't hold assets. That is correct. So the only way to get that dead person's name off the title of the property, whether it's real estate or an account or what have you, is to go through a probate under the will. If the title is in the name of the trust, a trust doesn't die. A successor trustee steps in and controls the assets of the trust. So that's why you don't need a court and that's why you don't need a judge. Trusts don't die. They're, they're concepts. They're, they're legal constructs. In terms of the flexibility that you have with a will, how would you compare that to the flexibility that you have in terms of a trust document? Is it similar in terms of discretion of who governs the assets, how they're distributed, and over what period of time? Uh, at death, there you can make them identical. You know, you can create a, a testamentary trust inside a will and make them identical. But then you've got a judge looking over the shoulder of the, of the testamentary trustee, the executor, um, typically, who becomes a trustee after it's a testamentary trust. Um, and so, you know, you, you're, you're less flexible in terms of what the trustee might be able to do. Now, that may be a good thing. I mean, there may be nobody in the family who you trust to be a trustee, in which case maybe you do want a testamentary trust. It's very rare um, that I'll draft a testamentary trust, but there are some rare circumstances where it's justified or warranted, where I want a referee in there. I want the, I want the guy in the robes to, you know, keep the siblings from killing each other. And what is the um, definition of the testamentary trust? Is that a trust that's created through the will? Yep. We, I brought this up earlier. It springs into existence at the death of the person. It's created by the will. And so it's a testamentary trust versus a living trust. So inter vivos and living mean the same thing during life. Inter vivos is, you know, they charge you an extra 500 bucks for that because it's Latin. Um, <laughs> inter vivos means Always during more expensive. life. Um, so it's a living trust. You fund it while you're alive. And so because you could become incapacitated, you're going to have incapacity provisions in the trust that you won't have in the will. The will has nothing to do with incapacity. So the analog for a will for non-trust assets is a power of attorney. So that's where I'm going. So you have a will, you have a trust for both incapacity and death, but you cannot put every single asset into a trust retirement accounts, for example, you can't fund them into a trust. So if you put a retirement account, I've got a, you know, 401k or an IRA or rollover IRA or, you know, any kind of qualified retirement plan, you put it into a trust, the IRS says you've deemed to have withdrawn it from that retirement account and stuck it in the trust. 
what is withdrawing income assets, untaxed assets from a retirement account trigger? It's a, not a trick question, Alex. You can answer that. It triggers, it triggers taxes. Income tax. Yeah, that's now, right. You're going to owe income tax. So if you fund a trust or the retirement account, you've just thrown you know, your million dollar retirement account at, at the taxing authorities and say, tax me on this. So we create a beneficiary designation. Usually the custodian of the retirement account will give this form beneficiary designation when you set up the account. Typically, you're going to benefit. You're going to nominate your spouse if you're married as the primary beneficiary. So the spouse could exercise a rollover. Sometimes, as in a blended family, we may not want to do that. We may want to have assets more balanced than that. I mean, we may want to have the trust. We may want to have an option of the wife to take a certain amount of the retirement account or the spouse take a certain amount of the retirement account and a certain amount of the retirement account gets peeled off and goes to children from the prior marriage. So in a blended family, we're often looking at, at a little more technical you know, decision regarding funding. But we look at that beneficiary designation form that the custodian gives us, and it'll say primary beneficiary, secondary beneficiary. Probably 80% of the time, primary beneficiary spouse, secondary beneficiary trust, because if the spouse is in the same plane crash, right, they can't take, so you gotta have a secondary beneficiary. And the trust is usually gonna have provisions for what happens at the death of the surviving spouse. So it'll then split, in your example, it'll split into five, five kids, and they'll have to take a distribution from the um, from the trust within a certain period of time, depending upon how this trust is structured. So the downsides of having a will and having assets titled in one's personal name when they pass away is that it's a court procedure. It tends to be quite lengthy as well. I mean, I understand probate can take months. Is that right? Years, yeah. I mean, take if years. it's a contested probate, it can take years. Anybody right. and, who is is uh, Pollyannish about that should read Charles Dickens' Bleak House. And there's okay. a case in there called Jarndyce versus Jarndyce, where literally the lawyers lived off the, the state for decades. Right. Well, so there's not only the time element. Uh, talk a bit about the costs of the probate process, both from just any fees at the state level and also the legal fees that could play into that. It's, yeah, and there are executor fees and there's a bond. So the cost can include a bond premium. You know, filing fees are are not a significant cost, but it's, you know, every $500 matters, right? So it, it's around a $500 filing fee to get the probate started. The bond is usually based on the creditworthiness of the executor or the administrator or the what, what's generically referred to as the personal representative. So personal representative means either executor or administrator. So if the personal representative is bondable, then they would post a bond. There are exceptions to that where you could get the, all the beneficiaries to waive bonds. Sometimes courts will not allow the beneficiaries to waive bond if the uh, personal representative is out of state, for example. Um, so you know, we can sometimes run into issues where even where we get everybody to agree, the court doesn't agree. The court is like another party out there that disagrees with what the parties have agreed to do because there may be a creditor out there. And what if the out of state executor or personal representative distributes to the to the heirs and disinherits the creditor? The creditor doesn't have a bond to go out. To. They could go out to representative, but they may be insolvent, which is what a bond is for. So there's a bond premium depending upon the credit worthiness and the size of the million dollar estate, it's going to be, you know, up to 1%, even for a credit worthy personal representative. So you got $10,000 a year, maybe, maybe 5,000 to pay, you know, maybe they're super credit worthy a year going to a bonding company. Then you're paying an accountant to do an accounting. Now you think, well, I got to do an accounting anyway to pay my taxes. The, the, yes, you have to do a tax return. But a tax return and a probate accounting are two different things. A probate accounting is a four schedule accounting. So you've got to pay an accountant an additional fee in order to do the accounting. And don't forget the lawyer and the personal representative need to be paid. And in California, it's a statutory commission based on the size of the estate. It's 4% of the first 100,000, 3% of the next 100,000. 2% of the next 300,000 and 1% of the next 500,000 and half a percent over a million. So 
if when you start running the numbers, you know, two hundred thousand dollar estate, it's a seven thousand dollar commission to each of the attorney and the executor. It's a five hundred thousand dollar estate. It goes up from there. You can see how it's like. Okay, so seven plus two percent of three is six. Is thirteen? It's a thirteen thousand dollar fee to each of me and the personal representative. So by by forcing the probate, you've created delay. You've created this public record, a notice to creditors, bond premium, accounting fees, court filing fees, and legal and personal representative fees. Okay, so it can turn into an expensive proposition very quickly, and that plays into the cost benefit of having the estate planning done in the first place, right? Because if you pay $5,000, $10,000 to have the trust put in place, and you save much more than that uh, just by not having to go through probate, that's where the, the cost benefit really yeah. comes and through, that's correct? A, that's a simple probate avoidance trust. That's that's a purpose. Um, it's generally not what drives people to come in though. You know, I mean, professional fees and taxes and probate fees are a concern. Sometimes, you know, that is what drives them, that's fine. But then when they realize you know, the power they have to make decisions in the event of their own incapacity or death and really anticipate what could happen if their their daughter needs some credit or protection because she gets in a car crash and she doesn't have enough insurance, or they're concerned about the divorce that their son is going to have with his partner, and they're concerned that his partner may not be as fiscally responsible as the son and may have access to the son's money after the death of the surviving spouse. You, you get where it's going. Those, after counseling, tend to be bigger concerns in these little probate. Maybe the probate fees drive them to my office, but I assure you, when they leave with peace of mind, it's not because they're going to save $14,000 in fees or their kids are going to save $20,000 in fees. It's because their kids are going to have peace of mind knowing that an unwanted ex-spouse isn't going to have their hand in their parents' money or that a creditor, uh, an unwanted creditor, not one they voluntarily take on, but a, you know, an unanticipated hospital bill, a car crash that's uncovered by liability insurance, uh, you know, you name it. When that creditor doesn't have access to the fund set aside in trust. The peace of mind they have is in that. And then if something happens to the daughter while well, she has minor children, it's going to go to the grandkids. It's not going to go to her spouse or it's not going to go, you know, somewhere it doesn't belong. That control that they have, that they can ensure that it stays in the family and stays with the people they love and that they care about is generally the bigger motivator. But certainly by the time they've gone through the counseling and they, they're empowered by the experience, they're empowered by knowing you know, they especially, you know, you could imagine in a dysfunctional family or any kind of blended family, they're really empowered. Yeah. And to round out the documents, we talked about the will, we talked about the trust. How did the advanced health care directive and the power of attorney play into that, if at all? Yeah. So incapacity, which I've alluded to several times, the power of attorney is going to deal with finances in the event of an incapacity. It's typically a power of attorney over property management. Sometimes there's a special limited power of attorney to, you know, like sign a document while you're in Italy. You know, there could be a power of attorney for a number of reasons. But um, a power of attorney for property management, your general statutory foreign power of attorney is going to deal with finances. So you've given your agent the ability to control bank. Okay, are you, you know, and the questions there are many. Are you going to give them the power to change beneficiaries on insurance policies? Are you going to give them the power to... Uh, alter beneficiary designations on government benefits, on employee benefits, on retirement plan. You know, so we've we've got to put thought into the powers we give to a financial management power of attorney. On the healthcare side, this is a proxy. The doctor's going to look. You know, if there's particularly in a gray area of surgery, they're going to look to the age. You know, the next of kid. Who is going to make the decision whether I operate on this brain clot and risk death, or we? attempt to dissolve it and risk paralysis, but a uh, less risk of death. And it's somebody in the medical, in the family that maybe has some medical background would be an appropriate agent under healthcare power that you wouldn't want them necessarily managing your money. So a healthcare power 
is going to be more more designed to designate an agent to carry out healthcare directives um, to determine you know whether you're you stay in your personal residence or you're put it in a skilled nursing facility. Um, that's a critical decision for a lot of people. I want to stay in my home, so put that in the healthcare power of attorney. Notify your healthcare proxy or your agent for healthcare that that's what you intend to do. But at some point in time, that becomes uneconomic. You know, for somebody to live at home, it could be twenty thousand dollars a month, thirty thousand dollars a month. Nursing home average private pay rate is probably nine thousand a month. So, you know, you've got really different um, financial expenses associated with those two things, and you want your your healthcare agent to be able to balance those and to know what your wishes are while you had capacity and you were alive and well and able to communicate to them, you want to put that in the healthcare document. You can also do such things as anatomical gifting and memorial instructions and disposition of remains. And, you know, uh, there are a number of things that people put in various healthcare documents. Um, but the key one for most people is this determination about what where they're going to live if they lose capacity and they have a long-term care problem. Um, wh who's, who is help making those medical decisions on their, who's making sure they get their medication, who's making sure they're seeing their, they're getting to their doctor's appointments. Um, so that it really is a critical role, uh, even though it may or may not be the same person who has the control over the checkbook, the agent under the financial power of attorney. And is it possible to combine the advanced healthcare directive and the power of attorney, or should they be separate? They're separate reserve? documents. Yeah, they're different parts of the probate code. They're governed by different uh, um, statutes. They're governed by you know different provisions about what makes them valid. So, for example, uh, statutory foreign power of attorney requires this, the uh, preparation statement from the attorney who prepared it, whereas. A healthcare power of attorney doesn't require that, but it requires, in the event the person is in a skilled nursing facility, the signature of the ombudsman of the facility. So they have different requirements depending upon whether it's a healthcare power of attorney or a power of attorney for property management. Okay. So we've talked about advanced power of uh, advanced healthcare directive, power of attorney. Those are basically governing how assets and affairs are managed while someone's alive. But once someone passes away, that's when the will and or trust kick in, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And who are the parties that are applicable to an estate and who are the parties that are applicable to a trust? Because it's really a relationship between a number of parties, right? Yeah. Yeah. So estate, I'm glad you use the word estate because that's what a probate attorney would call the assets in a probate. So estate is sometimes used interchangeably you hear the word estate tax and estate tax is a different kind of estate than probate estate <laughs> and, to, and the, the law does that on purpose i think to confuse people um, so the probate estate is just the assets that are subject to court supervision and the probate estate is typically governed by the will if there is no will it's governed by what's called intestacy the legislature has sections in the probate code that talk about well the community property goes all to the spouse. The separate property goes, you know, half to the spouse, half to one child. If there are two children, it goes a third to the spouse, two thirds to the be divided equally among the children, et cetera. You know, so the and it, it, it somewhat uh, reflects the idea of the legislature about what most Californians or Nevadans or most people of that state, how they would want their estate to go maybe maybe not you know <laughs> so if there is no will we end up having we we don't have a executor nominated because we have no will so we we have to nominate a personal representative and there's a whole section in the probate code about priorities of who gets priority to be personal representative when there is no will so that's the probate estate piece the trust piece much simpler the assets are all titled in the name of the trust so the successor trustee simply steps into the shoes of the prior trustee. They're the equivalent of the executor under the will or the personal representative under the will. They're the successor death trustee under the trust. So usually that's the same person. So I don't even bother asking people, who do you want your executor to be? Because they probably already answered that question by telling me who they want their successor death trustee to be. It's likely going to be the same. It's the same characteristics. It's the person who's gonna handle your affair, financial affairs when you're dead. Why would it be any different whether it came from a probate asset or a trust asset? Just because you 
left something out of the trust, why would you want somebody different to handle that? Now, that being said, there may be reasons. So some, some people could qualify to be a successor trustee, but they couldn't necessarily qualify to be a personal representative because they don't, they're not bondable, for example. So there, there might be circumstances where you would have a different personal representative versus a successor death trustee, but they line up. Then we do successor incapacity trustees in the trust. So who do you want to manage your affairs if you're incapacitated? And that lines up, not unsurprisingly, uh, with the agents under the power of attorney. So the financial power of attorney matches the incapacity trustees under the trust. So they're going to deal with trust assets in the event of the incapacity of the trust store over here as a successor incapacity trustee. They're going to deal with the non-trust assets over here as an agent under the financial power of attorney. So it's the same role. So therefore, it's typically the same person. So when we draft the trust, it's almost automatic. I can turn around and populate all the fields. You know, the, soft, the, the software is very robust. That's why I say the documents aren't that critical. It's all this counseling that you and I are talking about now that's the important part in the decisions that are made because populating the software is once I figure out what the client wants, it's just like boom, 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 boom radio buttons, you know, and you <laughs> pop them in. Do you want the death, the, the executors to be the same as the death trustees? Yes. Whoosh, populates. Do you want the agents under the power of attorney to be the same as the incapacity trustees? Yes. Whoosh, populated. You know, so it's just, it's very, very uh, fast. Um, to do the drafting. So people, that's why I say, get away from the idea that estate planning is about documents because the documents are not the hard part. The hard part is what you and I are doing now is sorting through what are your goals? What? I didn't even think that was pot. You mean I could disinherit my son-in-law? I could prevent him from getting to my daughter's wealth in the event they get divorced? Yes, you can. Yes, we, we, we can do that. We, we set that up on purpose. We do it all the time. Um, and, you know, in Nevada, for example, where I'm also licensed, you can do silent trust. You can do other things. Nevada has much more flexible laws. So you can do what's called a silent trust. So nobody knows about the existence of the trust. Where in California, at the death of the, the, the trustor, if the trust becomes irrevocable, there's a statutory notice that has to go out. It's called a stat notice. It has to go out to all heirs who would inherit whether or not there was a trust and then all beneficiaries name in the trust. So it has to be, the notice has to go out to a lot of people. Some people cringe at that if they've got some secrets and some skeletons in the closet and the idea that their <clears throat> loved ones might find out about something they'd prefer they not find out about. We use a Nevada silent trust for that situation. Okay, all right. So with the estate, the basic parties are the executor right or the administrator who manages or personal representative, the assets, personal representative. yeah okay and then you have the is it the grantor of the estate the person who puts in the assets That's and who, the testator the, the will testator. maker yeah okay. the will maker is the same as the testator and then the trust and then they're beneficiaries the side, it's yeah then beneficiaries are the people who receive it benefit from it after death okay. on the trust side you have trustor or settlor, those are synonymous. Sometimes grantor, you'll, you'll see grantor, settlor, trustor. And in some documents, it's called trust maker, the person who makes the trust. Trustee, there's usually just one word for trustee. I haven't seen, you know, it, it, there, there is what's called a directed trust in Nevada. And you can have a distribution advisor and an investment advisor that are really trustees. So technically a distribution and invest, distribution advisor, investment advisor might be a trustee. But that's a that's like it, a 400 level course, Alex. You know, that's beyond what we were talking about here. You just call them a trustee in a trust. And then you would have beneficiaries just like in the case of a will. So trustee and beneficiaries, personal representative and beneficiaries match. And then you have like 15 different names for the synonyms of a, 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 the testator, trust may, will maker, um, et cetera, decedent. <laughs> we right, call right. them lots of things. And a little while back, this was a few years ago, the 
amount that was exempted from the estate tax was relatively low. So a lot of estates were in a situation where they would likely have to pay some estate tax. It used to be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, above which point you'd be subject to a 40% estate tax. And at that time, the AB trust structure was fairly popular, was it not? And, and what does that actually consist of? And is that still being used today with the exemption from estate tax at about, it's over 12 million now that's not yeah. subject to estate tax? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Yeah. So many times um, we're asked to re do a do over. We need a do over of our trust from 1997. Yeah, in 1997, the exemption was $600,000. It went up to 660. It gradually went up to about a million in 2001. There was this uh, statute called egg trade. Then it stayed at a million for a few years and it went to a million and a half. Around 2008, it went to uh, uh, three and a half. No, in 2009, it went to three and a half million. In 2010, for one year, it went away. We carry over basis, a whole different regime. So if anybody died that year, we've got a totally different set of forms we have to use for 2010. Then in 2011, it was somewhat simplified um, to uh, 5 million index for inflation. Uh, and that was memorial. It was supposed to expire at the end of 2012. There was this rush to do things, and they extended that with what was called the ATRA, the American Taxpayer Relief Act in 2012. And so that extended this 5 million index for inflation until 2017. Then in 2017, that had been in been indexed to inflation to about six million by that point in time and he, and under the trump administration it was doubled in 2017. <laughs> so just to really confuse us all so now it's about 12 million and in, again indexed for inflation but because of the way congressional budgeting rules go you have to for any any um cost to the federal budget it has to balance with an, with a, a revenue source or it expires in 10 years. So they had to set it up to expire in 2026. So, so at the end of 2025, it's going to go back to 6 million index for inflation. So we've got a lot of people that, you know, in that 6 to 12 million category, and that's why you asked me before, I said we do a lot of upper middle class planning because that spot requires some thought. Um, what do we do? about you know a 10 million dollar estate my clients usually want to live to 2026 you know they like the idea of living past that and not planning to die before then and so should we set up an ab and an ab simply you know takes the the community assets or husbands and wives and splits them in half roughly in, in, a, in a community property state it takes the joint trust splits it in half sticks half in a B trust, that's the decedent's half, and leaves half for the survivor's trust. Well, what happened in 2012... And, and, so, and what is the benefit there in doing that? Well, the benefit there, back before what was called portability, the benefit there was that you could use the coupon, you could use the $6 million twice. You could use first to die's coupon for $6 million and second to die's coupon for $6 million, effectively doubling the $6 million to $12 million until portability came along. So portability then, Congress said, this is a silly rule. Everybody has to do these complicated AB trusts. And so Cong Congress thinking they were simplifying, and I think every single tax act should be, the new tax act, is it really simpler as Congress promises? Because it never is simpler. Us tax nerds, we laugh at the term simplifying because every time they yeah. simplify it, they add 2,000 pages to the code. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> right? so that's exactly what happened with portability. So you can port your exclusion, but now it forces you to file a form 706 and elect portability within a certain period of time after the first spouse died. What was happening was so many people were not doing that because you know they thought, well, I don't need this portability that they had to keep asking for relief for the under what's called a private letter ruling and relief from this de blowing the deadline the two what was in the two-year deadline and so congress finally you know kept kicking the deadline out for when you have to file this portability election but you still have to file an estate tax return a 706 it's a twelve thousand dollar tax return so a lot of clients get really frustrated with you know portability has not really made anything simpler or less complicated it's forced them to file a return that they wouldn't have had to file if they had simply just set up a B trust. 
it's ticking a twelve thousand dollar box basically yeah. okay yeah so it's it, it, we we have to think through all of this this is why the goals matter some people are, are concerned about you know the costs and the professional fees and all. other people are like you know i get you know i i want to mitigate professional fees to the extent possible but i really if my estate goes to an unintended heir what does it matter if that unintended heir saves fifty thousand dollars in legal fees my estate is at my son-in-law's new wife's child's name from her prior marriage you know they've blown that that's no estate plan at all they've completely blown the estate plan so it's more important to go to the people they want even if it's going to cost an extra few thousand dollars right so um that's what we run into with that with that six to twelve million dollar bracket. Now above twelve billion, it's a little it's actually easier because you know the decisions are somewhat, you know, we're gonna set up what's called a disclaimer trust. So it's an A B trust. Usually, usually there are exceptions to everything. A B trust splits into two at the death of the first spouse. And we take the decedent's half of the community and we we can disclaim that off to a B trust, avoid the 706, or we can leave it in the um marital trust you know leave it in the estate file the and and don't file an estate tax return or or, and file the estate tax return elect portability allow for the portability to double the 12 billion so it's in the now it's called a q-tip or a marital trust that gets added to the survivor's estate but you also add the coupon that then existed at the death of the first spouse to die so you add that 12 million onto their coupon their 12 billion dollars and they have 24 million so we have to balance all of the, you know, we have to balance how we're going to do this with the estates in the different ranges, under 6 million, 6 to 12 billion, above 12 billion. Those are in essence the, and then above 24 million, because that's double. So a, a husband and wife or two spouses, husband and husband, wife and wife, um, have 24 million to, to example. What if you have 34 million? What do you do about that incremental 10 million above the 24 million? Well, if you do nothing, your heirs pay $4 million in tax. It's 40% of 10 million. 4 million is a lot of money that can pay for a lawyer to fix it. And so we have solutions as we get into higher net worth estates about how to compress and distribute and deal with those larger estates to to the extent we can um, reduce estate taxes. We can usually eliminate them um, you know, obviously there's complexity and expense to eliminating $10 million of estate tax. You're not going to do that with a form. Um, it's going to require, you know, some, a sharp pencil, a, a good CPA, a decent attorney, a good attorney, a, a, a better than a stellar attorney and a stellar CPA and a stellar financial advisor. I mean, if that triumvirate is working together well and they're all in conference calls and on the same page and they're educating each other because nobody knows everything and you and i are educating each other about the client situation and everybody's in agreement and they make a a consistent recommendation to the client the client knows what to do oh you guys all agree can we tweak it you know usually then there's a question about can i tweak it like this i don't really want this aspect and then usually ends up back in the triumvirate and and we talk about is that tweak doable how does it affect other things we come to solutions so that's on the, on the very large estates we still can use the triumvirate on the under six million dollar estates but our questions might be more focused on income tax it might be more focused on management trustee selection um you know maintaining it in the family you know so we have a different set of questions and concerns in the smaller in the more modest i would say smaller because everybody's estate is everything they've earned. So it's important to them. It's 100% of what they've earned throughout their life going to the people they care about the most. So, you know, you think about like real estate, I pay 6% commission to buy a house. It's one transaction, I pay 6%. You know, now here, this is a transaction that covers everything. Covers everything I've ever, all my houses, all my condos, all my cars, all my bank accounts, all my, and and I'm worried about $6,000, you know, it, it, it just, it kind of boggles my mind sometimes when you think about the enormity of what they're doing when they do estate planning and to be driven by, you know, this, this, you know, uh, concern about, Oh, I, I might, I could save $3,000 if I go down the block. You know, it's like, okay. it's grabbing pennies before the steamroller. Yeah. 
<laughs> All right. So it sounds like the AB trust structure is still being used to mitigate or eliminate estate taxes. And my understanding is you have the decedent's trust, you have the survivor's trust, and from the decedent's trust, there could still be some payments paid out to the survivor, and that's generally governed by what's known as a HEMS provision. I was wondering if you could touch on what that means yeah. and, and how that can work. Yeah. And, and hands, you know, that's interesting because, you know, this is where blended family planning is really tricky. It's a second marriage situation. Um, you know, oftentimes there's a disparity in age between husband and wife, and it's just a supply demand thing, I think. But um, in many instances, the second wife is 10 years younger or more than the husband. Um, and this puts her almost at the age of the kids. And so if she's got a principal, what's called a principal invasion right, meaning she can invade the principal of the decedent's trust, the, the, the deceased husband's estate, for her health, education, maintenance, and support, well, who's going to define what health, education, maintenance, and support is? Well, the trustee d decides it, but there's all sorts of provisions that we build into the decedent's trust to deal with things like, well, cosmetic surgery. So she wants a facelift and a boob job. That's health. Should she be able to invade principle for that? Um, she wants to go to New Zealand to learn um, zoology of some sort. That's education. Are we going to allow that? So there's definitional issues and then who decides and a lot of times the husband's oh well you know she should be the sole trustee it's i love you honey i trust you well you'll do this right the kids may disagree with that because and they're going to second guess her so you're setting that up for conflict right away having an independent third party trustee mitigates that to a degree and then instructing the independent third party trustee may you invade principle for this purpose or must you invade principle for this purpose um, is it your reasonable discretion by which you invade the principle or is it your sole and absolute discretion by which you invade principle? So there's some legal technical things we get into with blended families that can really make a difference in mitigating that dispute, the potential for the dispute between the surviving spouse and the children from the prior marriage, which is, you know, where where most of the trust of the state litigation comes from, frankly, All right, want, and not most, but a plural. I'll say a plurality. Got it. Got it. And as we round out the hour here, being that you are on the side of state and trust disputes, you deal with this uh, on a fairly regular basis. What, without any revealing any personal details, is a juicy estate or trust dispute that you were involved with in some way that you can share with us? That well, shows us an well, example I've of what can all. go wrong in a state planning I've, if it's I've not done right. I've had mistresses appear with, with trust funds. I've had uh, daughters not notify out of country uh, uh, step parents the, of the death of their spouse for years sometimes um, or, or the existence of a will or the existence of a trust or by the way, your spouse had all this money. Um, I've seen, you know, multiple cases of real estate being being fractionalized among generation after generation, 10 percent to this son, 10 percent to this daughter, 20 percent to this nephew, whatever. And then they don't all get along and somebody wants to build a solar farm and they can't agree, even though it's a million dollars a year in rent. And somebody wants to just be a jerk because they want to be bought out. And, you know, so, I mean, that's just like barely scratching the surface of the kinds of things I've seen. Um, you know, fights over the business, you know, usually having multiple siblings involved in a business, there's going to be some in internecine struggle about who's CEO and who's CFO or who's man, you know, that can often happen. And so maybe, maybe mom or dad decided, okay, well, let's, let's let daughter A run the business and son B get the cash. And then they're, resentful of each other because the son says the business is worth more and the daughter says the cash is worth more. You know, I could go on and on. It's um, 35 years of doing this. Um, I, I have seen it all. <laughs> it sounds like you have a whole TV show just no, about this. I haven't this. seen it all. I, every Law and order, trust in the states. The crazier, <laughs> a crazier fact pattern. So, 
All right. We got a question here in the chat from Lewis who asks, once a trust is established, could the trustees add to the trust? Yes. Yeah. So most trusts are allowed to have, a, 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 you know, a living trust. Like I establish a trust. I fund it. Now, once it becomes irrevocable, adding to a trust is going to have consequences. Um, so, for example, if my dad set up a trust for my benefit and I start putting my assets in, I've converted what was a third party trust to a first party trust and I lose credit or protection. It's certainly over my contribution. That's going to vary from from state to state. So that's a big it depends. If it's a basic revocable living trust and you're the grantor, you can continue to add. Okay, but at once it's irrevocable and you're the trustee at that point, your rights and adjusting. Well, you may have an are... obligation. Yeah, you okay. may have an obligation to add because you're as a trustee, one of your duties is to marshal assets of the trust. So you may have to go around and look for assets that the trust held or should hold. And we've seen, you know, we've seen literally cash in the mattress, um, cash behind the wall. And it's your obligation to disclose that and to add it to the trust. Um, and once they disclose it to me, they will do so. So, you know, a lawyer can't like conspire with their client. Oh, yeah, let's screw over your siblings and split the money. No, uh, we have a fiduciary obligation to marshal assets for the benefit of the beneficiaries. And if you're the trustee, you have that fiduciary obligation. And sometimes you're going to be put in conflict. I mean, the cash behind the wall is kind of a silly example, but there are more common examples where you may be living in the house that's trust property rent free, but you're paying the taxes and insurance. Well, is that enough to cover the rent? Well, you know, your siblings may have a different idea about that than you do. So there's a, there's a conflict of interest uh, in that circumstance where the trustee is lit. And that happens very, very commonly. Mom and dad, you know, have named the, the trust. The daughter who's already living in the property as a trustee. Well, without instruction about whether they should be paying reasonable rent or not. And so the other daughters or sons or what have you are saying, wait a minute, she's just living in the property for free, you know? So it, the, the circumstances and situations are many. Um, I know I digressed a little bit from, can you add to a trust? But, you know, there, there are a lot of reasons where a trustee should simply marshal the assets of the one trust. And if they want, to create another trust, they should just create another trust. If they want to add assets to that, create an identical trust if you want it to be identical and just make that your self-settled trust. And this one will be the third party trust for your benefit that has better creditor protection. It might skip your estate depending upon the power of appointment provisions. You know, I could go down a rabbit hole on that one. All right. Well, that's the hour, Peter. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your insights. I've learned a lot throughout this podcast and i haven't even gone through half my questions so hopefully you'll come back for another episode in the future we'd love to have you on and i think everybody here i'm just uh, seeing a lot of comments coming in uh that people are appreciating your time and uh sharing your insights so thanks you. again and uh, you're always welcome back you. appreciate it alex thank you all right peter have a good one all right thanks Take again care. all right bye-bye bye -bye. all right guys so there you have it peter myers his contact information is down in the video description if you want to get in touch for some solid estate planning. This guy has a lot of experience and a lot of wisdom that he'd be able to share with you. And the value is immense when you consider the potential savings in terms of probate fees and estate taxes. So with that, if you enjoyed the video, if you're still hanging out, like the video, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment down below. What'd you think? What could we do better? I always love reading your comments. And with that, as always, hopefully this was helpful. Thanks for watching.